Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to chapter five. Chapter five will be covering all of the four different types of macromolecules. So in the beginning of the chapter, it introduces you to macromolecules and how polymers are made and the difference between the monomers and, and polymers. This section of chapter five will be covering carbohydrates. So all of the molecules of life are considered macromolecules. Macromolecules are large molecules that are quite complex, but they become more complex as new functional groups. Remember from chapter four, there's functional groups and they each have, um, they give macromolecules their, their characteristics. But as more fun functional groups are added to macromolecules, it makes them quite a bit more complex. So there are four classes of large biological molecules or macromolecules, and they are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Again, this section will be covering carbohydrates. So each of these four classes of large biological macromolecules have unique properties that arise from the orderly arrangement of their atoms. And their atoms are gonna, of course, be parts of the backbone or the skeleton of the molecule and parts of the functional groups that are. So carbohydrates serve as, as fuel and, and building material for living systems. So carbohydrates include sugars and the polymers of sugars. So if you remember, a monomer is a single um, unit. And then when the single units come together by dehydration synthesis, they cr create polymers. So for carbohydrates, the simple sugars or the monomers are called monosaccharides. The complex more uh, polymers, which include um, many repeating units of various sugars, sometimes the same sugar. Those are called polysaccharides. Monosaccharides have unique molecular formulas that are usually in multiples of CH2O. So the, the uh, ratio of carbon hydrogen to oxygen is going to be a one to two to one ratio. Monosaccharides are classified by the location of the carbonyl Remember the carbonyl group, there's two types, the aldehyde and the ketone, and the number of carbons they possess. So here are a couple examples of trioses. Trios is the general term that is used to describe three carbon sugars. Three carbon sugars have three carbons in their backbone. So you can see one, two, three, one, two, three. Three carbon sugars have a general molecular formula of C3H6O3. So remember, I just described the ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen is going to be a one to two to one ratio. So if you divided all of these numbers by three, you would get one carbon, two hydrogen, and one oxygen. So the one on the left is called an aldose sugar because it has an aldehyde group on it. So here we can see the aldehyde functional group. This one happens to be called glyceraldehyde. This one is going to be very important later when we talk about cellular respiration and photosynthesis. This is quite an important sugar. A Ketose is a sugar that has a ketone functional group in it. So we can see this is a ketone. So remember the difference between an aldehyde and a ketone is that an aldehyde is usually found on the end. And we have the carbon double bonded to the oxygen. So that's characteristic of carbonyls. However, attached to this carbon is one carbon, is, is basically another carbon and a hydrogen. For the ketone, attached to the carbon double bonded to the oxygen are two carbons in this case. 
This is called dihydroxyacetone. Let's look at some other examples. I won't describe too much of them. So another type of sugar might be pentose, right? So this would be the general term for a sugar that has five carbons in its skeleton. So we have an aldose, uh, an aldose and a ketose for um, pentoses as well. So some examples would be ribose and ribulose. So here we see five carbons in its skeleton. And of course, this is an aldehyde sugar because it has an aldehyde functional group. And this one is a ketone sugar because it has a ketone as a functional group. Now, these also have hydroxyl groups because they're sugars. So they have these alcohol groups on them as well. Let's look at another one. We have hexoses. So hexoses are six carbon sugars. So you can see there are six carbons in the backbone. And of course, they can exist as an aldose or a ketose. Remember the aldose. These are two examples of aldoses that happen to be hexoses because they have six carbons in their skeleton. But they also have the aldehyde functional group, as opposed to fructose here, which has the ketone functional group. If we look on the left, we have glucose and galactose. There are, they, have, they are very similar in structure. The only difference is that on carbon number four, so here we see one, two, three, four, the hydroxyl group is on the right-handed side for glucose, and it's on the left-handed side for galactose. These are examples of enantiomers, so they are actually mirror images of each other. So if you turn them, flip them to the side, if you can imagine that, um, th where they're facing each other, all of the functional groups would be the, in the same exact location as if they were looking in the mirror at each other. So let's look at how um, a ring forms. So We've been looking at the linear structure of a carbohydrate, examples of carbohydrates. So this is an example of a hexose, and it happens to be an aldose. It's actually glucose. But let's look at how the ring structure forms. Now, it's important to know that in most biological systems, or most any system for that matter, especially if water is present, the glucose is going to be found in the ring form greater than 99% of the time. So it's very rare that glucose is gonna be found in the linear form. Let's see how it happens though. So if we look at these um, highlighted groups right here, so we have the aldehyl groups, the um, aldehyde group here at carbon number one, and then at carbon number five, of course, we have a hydroxyl group. Now, looking at, so again, there's an equilibrium between these two forms, so they can flip back and forth. However, it stays more to the ring side, especially if water is present. So what happens here is that this in water, this, see, here we have at, at carbon number five, we have the hydroxyl group. Well, in water, this hydroxyl group loses its hydrogen. So this makes this oxygen negatively charged. So this oxygen is going to attack carbon number one. So this carbon is kind of partially positive charge because remember oxygen has a high electronegativity. So it's gonna pull the electrons towards itself making carbon slightly positive. So then of course this negative oxygen is gonna be attracted to the slightly positive carbon and create a bond with it. So we can see now we have the ring structure of glucose formed where we have what used to be the hydroxyl group on carbon number five is now an oxygen that's actually part of the ring system. And then to the right of it, we have carbon number one, which used to be an aldehyde group, and now it has a hydroxyl group. So that hydrogen, which was lost on the hydroxyl group from carbon number five, is now attached to the oxygen on carbon number one to create the hydroxyl group. And we can see at carbon number six, we have the CH2OH. Okay, so here we can see that relatively right here, it's hanging off of the ring system. So carbon number six is not part of the ring system. And this kind of shows the representation and the number of each of the carbons plus all of the uh, groups that are attached to it. If we look at this, this is the abbreviated ring structure. So um, 
you can see that this is basically what it looks like and the reason why this bond and this one is partially um, thicker but this one is definitely thicker is because it's supposed to indicate three-dimensional structure and basically this part of the ring structure if you can imagine is coming out of the page and the back side of it is going into the page so basically there's a plane above the ring and a plane below the ring almost like if you um, you uh, spread your fingers and your kept your hand uh, 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 horizontal and you spread your fingers you would have the you would see the top of your hand but then if you flipped it over you would see the bottom of your hand but if you keep it so that the top of your hand is is facing your eyes you can see that that would represent really the the um, upper plane of the ring and then your palm which you can't see at this point would be the lower plane of the ring now let's look at some variations of other carbohydrates. So a disaccharide, so remember a, a, um, a monosaccharide is going to be a single unit. It's, it's basically a simple sugar. Well, a disaccharide is formed when the dehydration reaction or dehydration synthesis results in, the, in a connection or a bond between two monosaccharides. So di means two. So now we have two monosaccharides connected together. And when carbohydrates undergo dehydration synthesis, they create what's called a glycosidic bond or often called glycosidic link. So this is a glycosidic linkage. Let's take a look at it. So we have the dehydration reaction. If you remember reading in the beginning of chapter five, that it describes the dehydration reaction and dehydration really means like loss of water. So that's basically what's happening here. We have glucose and another glucose. And then here we have carbon number one and carbon number four, right? So we have carbon number one, carbon number four. They're going to react with each other. So in carbon number one, the hydroxyl is going to be removed and in carbon or glucose number one and glucose number two, the hydrogen is going to be removed. And these two combine to create water. And what the result is, is basically a connection between this hydrogen right here and the oxygen and glucose number two. And this forms maltose. Maltose is the name of this disaccharide where two glucose molecules undergo dehydration synthesis so that they create a glycosidic linkage between them. So now they're bonded together and these are covalent bonds. And this is called a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. And it's 1,4 glycosidic, li glycosidic linkage because carbon number one is connected to carbon number four. So carbon number one on the first glucose is connected to carbon number four on the second glucose. And this creates again maltose. So let's see the formation of sucrose. Sucrose, you might be familiar with that term. This is a simple table sugar. So basically this is uh, a reaction between glucose and fructose. Fructose is a different type of sugar. So glucose has a six membered ring Fructose only has a five-membered ring. Okay, so it has five atoms that make up the ring. And as you can see, fructose is a little bit different where, um, remember, fructose was a ketone, so the reaction be, um, with the ketone is going to be a little bit different. That's going to result in a CH2OH on both sides of carbon number one and carbon number four. Either way, the dehydration reaction is the same. And glucose, it's going to lose a hydroxyl, and fructose is going to lose the hydrogen, and this forms water. So water is a product of this reaction. And then the result is a 1-2 glycosidic linkage. So here we have carbon number one is connected to carbon number two. So we have carbon number one, two, three, four, five, and then six here. So this is 1,2 glycosidic linkage. Again, this is dehydration reaction, and this is a glycosidic bond, and this forms sucrose. So polysaccharides have a number of different functions. Polysaccharides can function in storage of energy. 
and they can have structural roles. Now there's a number of different types of polysaccharides, both for storage and structural. So the structure and function relationship is basically determined by the type of monomers that are connected together and the positions of its glycosidic linkage. So what I'm saying is that whether it has a structural role or a role in storage of energy, it really depends on the monomers that are being connected together and the positions of their glycosidic linkages. So let's look at an example. So storage polysaccharides are a little bit simpler and they're storage polysaccharides because they store energy which can be used later upon breaking them apart. So remember polysaccharides are basically repeating units or units of monosaccharides connected together. But they're connected together by bonds that are easily broken because they need to be easily broken so that they can be readily available to extract the energy from that as a food source or an energy source. So if we look at some examples of polysaccharides that have storage functions, we have starch and we have glycogen. Starch and glycogen are very similar in their repeating units of glucose. However, starch is repeating units of glucose, um, which generally has a more simple overall structure. So starch can exist in a single chain, or it can exist with some branch points, but not many. So if it has any branching, right, branching of, of glucose, it's called amylopectin, or this is an example of it. And then amylose would be an example of starch, which does not have any um, uh, branch points. Glycogen, so starch is going to be found, these types are, are going to be found in plants. Glycogen is the storage uh, polysaccharide for animals. So glycogen granules are going to be stored in the muscle tissue of animals. So plants don't have muscle tissue. So the um, starch is going to be stored within the starch granules, usually in the chloroplast. So if we look at these overall structural structure, they're relatively simple. However, glycogen is a little bit more complex. So if we look at the plant cell, the plant cell wall is made up of, uh, of, a, a, of a polymer that, that is a, a structural type of of a, has a structural type of role. So um, remember starch and glycogen are going to be storage, so they store energy. But then um, plants also produce structural type of polysaccharides, which are going to be a lot stronger because the bonds are harder to break. So cellulose is the name of this molecule, and cellulose is repeating units of glucose. However, it's a different form of glucose that is connected with each other. We're going to talk about those different forms. So let's first look at starch. Again, this is storage in plants, and starch is stored in the starch granules. These are typically found in the chloroplast, but they can be found in other regions of plants. So starch is repeating units of glucose. So here we see amylose, which is an unbranched repeating unit of glucose, and amylopectin, which is um, a branched, but it's somewhat branched. It doesn't have a lot of branches as compared to glycogen, which is um, polysaccharide in animals. Again, this is going to be found in the glycogen granules found in the liver and muscle. Again, this is repeating units of glucose. However, there's a lot more branching in glycogen as opposed to the amylopectin that we just described. So structural polysaccharides are going to be stronger. So again, the plant cell wall, the glucose mon monomers are going to be connected um, connected together by the uh, glycosidic linkages. However, the glycosidic linkages differ because of the type of glucose that's being connected together. So um, cellulose molecules remain um, in a linear type of format and they can hydrogen bond with other linear chains of, of this polymer. 
and this creates what's called fibers okay and then the fibers kind of aggregate together to create microfibrils and then of course that's going to create cellulose which makes up the plant cell wall now we've been talking about these differences and um, some differences between the glucose monomers that connect together but let's describe what those differences actually are so the difference again is um, is going to be based on the type of glucose that is connected together which results in a different type of glycosidic bond when dehydration synthesis occurs so there are two forms of glucose remember glucose is going to be typically found in the ring form but it could exist in two different types of rings so it depends on which direction um, the hydroxyl group or this oxygen right here in carbon number five attacks this carbon from so if it comes from the left side then it is going to form alpha glucose because this carbon or this oxygen right here is going to gain a hydrogen but it'll be below the plane of the ring so alpha glucose is the ring form of glucose where on carbon number one the hydroxyl group is found below the plane of the ring on the other hand, if this oxygen attacks from the right side, it'll create a situation where this oxygen will be on the above the plane of the ring. So this is called beta glucose. So here you can see the difference, right? It's highlighted. Okay, so we have carbon number one and carbon number two. Carbon number two has a hydroxyl group. Same here. However, at carbon number one, the hydroxyl group is below the plane of the ring in alpha glucose and above the plane of the ring in beta glucose. Now let's compare the overall structure of starch and cellulose. So if we look at the top, um, this is an example of starch with only four repeating units of glucose. So you can see all the glucose molecules are oriented in the same way. So you can see carbon number six is across the top and the on carbon number two, the hydroxyl group is all across the bottom. And again, this is going to be um, one four linkage of alpha glucose molecules. So starch is made up of alpha glucose monomers or molecules. Cellulose, on the other hand, is going to be one four linkage of beta glucose monomers. Now it's important to note, remember the difference between alpha and beta. At carbon number one, alpha glucose, that hydroxyl group was found below the plane of the rim, so you can see the way the, uh, the linkages form. Now in, be in uh, beta glucose, the hydroxyl group is going to be found above the plane of the ring. Now, in order for this to happen, every other glucose molecule has to be flipped upside down. Okay, so it's flipped in terms of the plane of the ring. So here we can see above the plane of the ring as on the top, same as the one in starch. However, if you look at the glucose next to it, it's basically flipped so that the below the plane of the ring is now above the plane of the ring. So it's it's flipped. So if you basically took your hand, remember that horizontal position, and you flipped it up. Now here we can see that the hydroxyl group is down below the plane of the ring here, or the, the string of, of glucose monomers, but now it's at the top. And then it gets, the next one is down below, and then this one is at the top. So again, it's it's flipped, right? So every other one glucose monomer is going to be flipped. Now this is important because um, the difference between these is basically the ability to actually break those bonds. So it's easier for um, water and other enzymes to be able to get to this glycosidic bond in starch because of this small group right here. And of course, oxygen is a lot more reactive and it's all across the same side. So it's easier to come from this side than it is to come from this side because we have this large um, functional group here. Now, this isn't one of the functional groups that you had to know, but it is a group that's hanging off there and it's in the way and it takes up space. So if we look at cellulose at the bottom, we have that large functional group on both sides. So this is going to take up space and it's really hard to get in there to actually break those bonds. Now, cellulose is, um, is something that we cannot break down as humans. We do not have the enzymes or the capability to break down cellulose. <laughs> 
but some organisms do. And uh, many organisms depend on um, gut microbes in order to help them break down cellulose. All right, so those are the difference between starch and cellulose. Remember, starch is going to be a storage polysaccharide in plants, and cellulose is going to be a structural polysaccharide in plants. So the structural ones are going to be a lot stronger, and the bonds will be harder to break. Now, let's look at the overall configuration of starch versus cellulose. If you look at starch, um, it has this, uh, what's called an alpha configuration. It creates these alpha helices, these, these helical type structures, even with the branching. So at the branch point, of course, it's going to disrupt the helix. However, the helix continues because of the way the glucose molecules are oriented together or bonded together. The beta configuration creates these long linear structures. They're straight and they're going to be unbranched and they can hydrogen bond with each other. Now within the alpha helix, the glucose molecules can hydrogen bond with each other, but they generally do not hydrogen bond between the polysaccharides. So on the right, we can see we have hydrogen bonding between the long unbranched straight polysaccharides. Now, um, again, I mentioned there's enzymes that specifically are able to digest starch by hydrolyzing these alpha linkages, but the ones that can digest or hydrolyze the alpha linkages can't hydrolyze the beta linkages in, in cellulose. So, um, as I mentioned, we do not have the enzymes that can hydrolyze the beta linkages in cellulose. So when we eat plants, um, usually this passes through the digester tract as insoluble fiber. So some microbes, as I mentioned, can use um, enzymes to actually digest cellulose. So an example would be termites, right? So they can break down wood. And um, also there are uh, microbes inside uh, the guts of, of cows, which actually eat a lot of plants. So, but they're able to actually break that down because of the microbes that are living inside them. So these are some examples here. We have the cows and we have the termites. Many of the herbivores um, have these, these types of symbiotic relationships, and that's what I'm talking about. It's a symbiotic relationship with the cow and the microbes that live in the gut. They depend on each other. So chitin is another structural polysaccharide. Chitin really um, is, is, is quite strong and it creates these, these um, very hard surfaces uh, and makes up the exoskeleton arthropods. And of course, chitin is also found in the cell wall of fungi. So if we look at the structure of the glucose that's found in chitin, and um, what's interesting is, is that carbon number two has this additional group right here. So it's a very large, and it's, it's an amino group which has a, a carboxyl or a, a carbonyl uh, group and also a methyl group attached to it. So this is a very large group. So this creates a lot more strength and inability of things to actually break it down. So of course, water is not going to be able to get in there and, and start to hydrolyze the bonds that connect them together. So in summary, the structure and function of carbohydrates, and of course, we'll talk about lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids and the other segments, but here we're talking about carbohydrates, the structure and function of carbohydrates. So in summary, we have, um, this is a monomer, and then when we connect the monomers by dehydration synthesis, we can create polymers. So carbohydrates are one of the four classes of macromolecules that can create polymers or can form polymers. Not all of them can. So some examples of monosaccharides would be glucose and fructose. And then if you connected various ones together, you could to create a disaccharide, which would be two monosaccharides connected together using that dehydration reaction, forming a glycosidic bond. So we have 
lactose and sucrose are a couple of examples, but there are plenty of others. So poly, some examples of polysaccharides. Um, so one would be cellulose. Remember, we described the structure of cellulose, and then we compared it to that of starch because they're both found in plants, but they have different roles because their structure is different. And then we talked about glycogen and, of course, most recently, the chitin. Now, um, the functions of carbohydrates, again, are going to provide a carbon source or fuel or energy for organisms to to break down and actually extract the energy that's released once they're broken down. And then um, some of them can, of course, those that create um, a have a structural role, and they create these very strong um, uh, overall structures within the organism. They can, they can it, basically cellulose, an example, can strengthen the plant cell wall. And then, of course, storing energy, this would be the uh, storage role. And then it could strengthen the exoskeleton of arthropods and, of course, the fungal cell walls, as in chitin. All right, thank you for listening.